This is the Gospels, lucky number 13, and um, in relationship to uh, a study of the Gospels, <clears throat> of course, um, you realize that the disciples, <clears throat> um, when they began to follow Jesus, that for them, for the disciples, the Gospels, or what we call the Gospels, what was written, <clears throat> was really a process of them learning what, who Jesus really was. And when I say that, I don't mean the Son of God, and, and I've shown things before, and I probably will before we end this class again. We're not talking about the uh, <clears throat> just learning that he was the Son of God or that he was God. <clears throat> We're talking about, I mean, you know, you think of Genesis, in the beginning God. No explanation. Just there's a God, okay, tough, believe it, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, that's kind of the way it's put. I mean, it's no, there's no apology for saying, you know, in the beginning, okay, you know, God, but I just want to explain or something like that. Doesn't do it. But in the beginning, God, with no explanation of who God is. Now, that's the key right there. Not just that Jesus was God, <clears throat> but that by Jesus, we're going to know God. By him, we're going to really know God. <clears throat> All right. So for the disciples, since, since the Gospels record their time period pretty much with Jesus, then the Gospels to them, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, equate this to us too. The Gospels should be this to us. The Gospels to them was a time period where they are learning the Lord <clears throat> and in learning the Lord they're learning God and um, and it's not, the Gospels were not written as some sort of his, historical essay <clears throat> but rather to communicate certain things that we may know him. <clears throat> but also in the Gospels, we have certain events and particulars which we've discussed. Um, obviously, the, the incarnation and then um, the, the cross and the death and the resurrection. <clears throat> and we've spent probably over half now of this this course dealing with the cross, dealing with thank you, dealing with um, finding the source, and I'm real big on finding the source, not just all of the tributaries. I want to know where it all comes from, because there you find the reality, <clears throat> there you find the heart of the matter. And so I, in that sense, I, then, I want to talk a little bit about resurrection. <coughs> but I want to, I'd like for us to address resurrection uh, in this class and possibly the next one. I'd love to get all this done in this first one. <coughs> I'd like to address it in the context of really God's view as, as best as I can comprehend God's view of it. And not just in terms of um, what is commonly held in terms of theology of what the resurrection is. And that's fine. Even if that's, even if that's right on, that's not our source. God is our source. The Holy Spirit is our source for these things. We can't just listen to doctrines by anybody, by me or anybody. We must find those things to be true for us. <clears throat> and um, 
But I want to go beyond that generally held truth of, of resurrection in terms of doctrine, which usually, number one, is future, and, and uh, number two, is usually almost summed up <clears throat> in this simple phrase that um, resurrection is, you know, someone, whether that's Jesus or us, <clears throat> Someone who died and then got up. <laughs> Someone who died and got up. All right. So that's, and that's pretty cool. But there's got to be more to it than that, than just dying and getting up. Okay. Well, what's, what's the big deal here then? Why not just not die? I, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean this, I, you know, if it's that simple, then why just, you know, <clears throat> What are you showing off? You know, you know what I'm saying. I mean, uh, you know, I know, you know, I don't expect anybody to think the way I do, but I think though, I go, what, what would be the point of that then? You know, Lord, come on, it's got to be more to you than this, more to you than us. You know what I'm saying? The way we are. Oh, oh, that He would be so much different than we are. <clears throat> All right. So what I've discovered in <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, in my searching thus far, is that God sees resurrection not just in terms of death and then getting up, but he, he really equates resurrection and transformation together. Together. Okay. Well, that takes it out of the realm of the future or out of the realm of just, you know, dying and getting up. <clears throat> That there's, there's meant to be within the kernel of this truth a transformation that happens in relationship to us and in our relationship to Christ. All right, so <clears throat> I realize that this isn't in the Gospels, but turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. <clears throat> and, uh, and if I can get done what I want to get done in this first class, Trust me, we will be in the Gospels big time. I mean, big time. Um, I've been waiting for it, but I've just. <clears throat> but uh, I don't. I do not personally believe, as your teacher, that it would have done you much good to just talk about these things outside of the context of what the the generally held teaching is. So here we are, Colossians chapter one, <clears throat> verse thirteen. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so this is, this is sort of amazing. If you, if you hear really what's being said, somebody opened it for me. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. That... We have been delivered, <clears throat> okay, we've been delivered, all right, <clears throat> what does that mean? We've been delivered, glory to God, you know what I mean, let's get in there with it, like the <clears throat> common, you know, yeah. but we have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of the son of his love, but we've been translated into the kingdom of the son of his love but not delivered from the presence of darkness. Now, is that, a, is that a sort of a shocker in a way if you think about that? Because we have been delivered from the power of darkness and we have been translated into the kingdom of the Son of His love, but we have not been delivered from the presence of darkness. Is that my stomach growling? <clears throat> What is that? Is that is that man or demon? What is that? All right. <clears throat> so right there, see? Right there. We read that all the time. <clears throat> but do we let that challenge us? And do we think enough through? And it's just one verse I read. We think through it enough to go, wait a minute, if we've been delivered past tense from the power of darkness, 
<clears throat> but we have not yet been delivered from the presence of darkness, but we have been translated into the kingdom of the Son of His love, then what is the explanation of the kingdom, the translation into the kingdom of the Son of His love, if not deliverance from the presence of darkness? Well, we know Jesus, <clears throat> you know, and our explanation in the past of, of the kingdom is, is wherever the king dwells. So we know that Jesus, when he walked this earth, he, he was fully governed by the nature of God, and he was, he was around lepers, and instead of him getting leprosy, they got healed. And he was around demoniacs, and instead of them jumping on him, he cast them out. And you see that? The point being that there is, um, there is the, the ability to be governed by the nature of Christ and yet not delivered from the presence of the enemy. But, but even though you're de not delivered from the presence of the enemy, you are delivered from his power because you're governed by something different than what everyone else is governed by. You're governed by the life of the king, if you will, the kingdom, the, the, the nature of the king. <clears throat> All right. So, but, but, but the wording here is that we have been translated have been translated into the kingdom of the son of his love. <clears throat> All right. So I was thinking about this, and I'm trying not to read everything I got here. I was thinking about this in terms of, <clears throat> of trying to grasp um, this resurrection. And, and we have in John 12, 24, and you can turn there if you want, but you, most of you should know it. And if you haven't got it memorized yet, get it memorized. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. All right. So there is a death mentioned there, isn't there? But if it die, but listen to the resurrection, it bringeth forth much fruit. See, I'm trying to get you out of the realm of just something that was dead got up. There is, there is a, <clears throat> a transformation. There is a one dead seed to a resurrection, which is a harvest. Ah, and the harvest can be <clears throat> seen in any number of ways. You know, you got, you got one seed. Let's just start with that. And then, you know, before too long, you begin to have a harvest that, that comes out of this whole thing. And wheat, you know, is just springing up and, you know, it's just going and going. Wow. <clears throat> See, I told you that we're not delivered from the presence <laughs> of darkness. And the Lord wants that to be clear. That that's <clears throat> right. So we got all this, we got all this harvest coming up, but you know, we also got all these seeds on here, don't we? Don't we have it? Isn't there on these wheat on this wheat that's coming up? We got all of this seed throughout this whole harvest. It is, and just one stalk. If one seed dies, it doesn't bring forth one new seed. It brings forth a bunch. Okay, and then you keep you keep following that path until there is a transformation or a shall I say. First of all, let's just say a resurrection. There's a resurrection, which is all this harvest coming up, which the stalks and everything look very different from the death. Okay? So there's a, <clears throat> as it were, a transformation <clears throat> from one seed to many stalks, ultimately to many seeds. Or shall we say, seed, which is proper in this case for sure, grammatically or not, you know, <clears throat> it is proper because it is the increase of Christ over and over and over and over, okay? <clears throat> All right, so um, <clears throat> the resurrection then has moved out of the realm of just somebody being dead and getting up because that's not a true, that's not, that's not in accord with John 12, 24, and that's not in, in accord with any farmer that's ever planted anything anywhere. That you put one down and it gets up. 
I mean, it's clear, isn't it? I mean, you know, you ever see a farmer put a seed in the ground, it dies, and then a little while later it goes, hey, you know, but the seed just stands up. You know, not, it's not like, Whoa, and then all this plant comes up. It just, the seed dies, and then it goes, okay, and then it stands up and goes, hey, I had one seed, it's me, I'm back. You know, that, that's, that is contrary to nature. You see? Well, God made nature. Right. And it is, and Jesus used that example, and I've told that story before, but I remember, you know, I remember teaching John 12, 24 once, and a brother said to me, oh, wasn't Jesus an amazing teacher to be able to think about, you know, he looked over and he saw a, a, a seed, you know, a bunch of wheat growing, and he says, I, you know, accept the seed, and he used a great example. Folks, before the world was, he's the, he, all things are made by him and for him and to him and by him. All of them consist. Th that was a shadow of him, always. He wasn't a great teacher. He was a great creator. He knew what he was doing, in other words, from the very beginning. We go, oh, we get off on all these little sentimental, dumb little things, man. Jesus is it. And when we discover that, then all of a sudden we, re we, don't, we realize he's more than a good teacher, you know. I mean, he was sort of insulted that that's all they got out of it. Oh, good teacher. Isn't that what, what uh, Nicodemus came and said? You know, good master, you know. <clears throat> and he said, except you be transformed, born again. See, and that's the pattern. That's the pattern. <clears throat> so... What am I saying at this point? I'm saying that there is, there is no resurrection in the, in the concept of what most Christians hold of us dying and just getting up. There has to be a transformation that takes place. And we're going to look at some scriptures that, that prove that. But there, there, God demands that there be a transformation. The cross demands that there be a transformation. The truth as it is in Jesus demands that there be a transformation. All right, so um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> and again, we're, you know, um, we're discussing this because we're talking about the kingdom of God and we're talking about the message of the Gospels. Okay. The message of the Gospels is not just that Jesus was the Son of God. The message of the Gospels is there's a, that he has come to bring a kingdom about and he's going to do it through death. Except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, and bite alone. But if it died, it brings forth much fruit. All right, so he's, he's going to, and he's the first seed of this kind. There are no other seeds like this kind. So the only way for it to multiply is not by, you know, laying on of hands or altar calls or, or and again, I, you know, I use those as examples. I use those examples not because there's really anything wrong with those, but because we misuse them. We use them in a wrong context, as if the power is in them instead of Christ crucified, and it's not. And, and the proof of that ought to be looking at the church since the charismatic movement. It's got smaller and less and weaker and, you know. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 49. <clears throat> As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. All right. This is the resurrection, the, the last part. Do you see it? Look at it. You, you'll see the resurrection. Bearing the image of the heavenly. That's, that's, it's not only the resurrection, it's the transformation. 
Because to God, there is no resurrection without a transformation because he's not just trying to raise dead people. Should I say it again? He is not just trying to raise dead people. He has no desire just to raise dead people. You know, come on, raise Lazarus. He's dying. Let him die. That's right. Then I'll get there, show up, raise him, and then say to everybody, I am the resurrection yes. and the life. Hallelujah. You know, I mean, he, he, <clears throat> it's like uh, Lazarus is going to die again, and he'll be gone. I am. You see? And, he's one, and that's Jesus talking from his heart. Trust me. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's Jesus trying to communicate truth, reality, as God understands reality. And we just continue to dis hear everything he says and fit it into our little doctrinal box, you know, and go, oh, that must fit over here. What if it doesn't belong over there at all? You know, over in this little corner of our doctrines. You know, what if there's a whole expanded understanding of who God is that the Holy Spirit wants to bring us into and we can't seem to break out because we're confined by our own understanding, by the things that we've already learned instead of learning Christ. Well, no one's going to talk you out. Of, you know, I mean, I, trust me, I know <clears throat> what this is like. I have shared like this, and there have been people who've been greatly afraid and offended with me because they thought I was trying to take away the Jesus that they have. But here's the, here's the funny thing. I'm not trying to take away the Jesus they have. I'm trying to get them in a position where the Holy Spirit can reveal the Jesus that is which, when it takes place, will take away the Jesus that they have in the sense of, you, you understand what I'm saying, in the sense of if it's an idol or if it falls far short of the glory of God, in those realms, that's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I, I genuinely believe that if, if, you know, Jesus said, if the light in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? Because you think it's light, you think you see, you think you have it, you know. But the wonder of light is that it automatically chases away darkness. You don't have to, it doesn't have little missiles on it. You know what I mean? To, to attack the dark, it doesn't. By its very nature, it just doesn't, see. And, and yet we've made a whole warfare thing out of something that, you know, we've, we've armed, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm armed and dangerous. I've heard that before. Well, never, never mind. <laughs> I, had, I had a thought. The power of the Holy Spirit has my tongue. I would just say this. Most, most of those people that said that and were along in those lines when the enemy really came in like a flood, they ran, okay? Okay, and I don't mean that, you know, to shame or anything like that. It's just that light chases away darkness. Not us or not our little, oh, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm armed and dangerous, man, look, you know? And I mean, I've seen him quote the scripture to the devil, and the devil just laugh and run over the top of him. You go, well, we're supposed to be able to quote the scripture. Yeah, you know, but you're supposed to know the scriptures. You know, and anyway. I'm sorry I get carried away like this, but I do. All right, Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> and we're talking about uh, resurrection that that is transformation as it were and 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 we're talking about we're trying to look at scriptures that help convince us that resurrection is and therefore kingdom coming in earth is really meant to be an actual thing <laughs> You know, I mean, not just a little cute thing that we quote or something. 
All right, this is uh, Romans 6, verse 3. Know ye not that as many as of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Well, I venture that a whole massive amount of Christians don't know ye not that. <laughs> you know, they've never even heard it. They don't, you know, and it's not even that they wouldn't believe it. They've just never heard it before. My question is always to them, you know, because I preach this and somebody goes, well, how come we never heard this before? I said, you don't have Romans 6 in your Bible? Well, I mean, you know, because I mean, you know, it's there. I didn't write it in there while you were <laughs> sleeping last night. It is clearly there. Okay, so we were baptized. You know, glory to God. Are you baptized? Oh, glory. Yeah, I'm baptized. You know, are you baptized into his death? Well, heck no. I don't want none of that. Jesus came to give life. This is all about life. Yeah, well, life comes out of death. All right, next verse. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That, what does that mean? With the purpose of that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. All right, notice it didn't say you were raised up. But on down it does, but you were raised up in Christ. But the resurrection for you is, in this verse, that you walk in new life. You see it? That's it. So, are there a lot of Christians, you know, really wanting the resurrection? Yeah, and, and whatever understanding they have. Do they understand the resurrection as Christ's new life? Or having been in the image of the earthly, now we shall bear the image of the heavenly. Do they see that as the resurrection? Do they see transformation? as resurrection that it is what you were you're not any longer and what he was he is and was and is to come and all of those who will bow their knee to that jesus all right and then uh <clears throat> second corinthians chapter three And for the record, there really is a paragraph after paragraph. I'm skipping here, but I'm getting, I'm hitting the high points. I'm riding the waves here, okay? <clears throat> Let's see. 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, so there is this transformation going on there. And in fact, the word change is the word metamorphosis. Where do we get the word metamorphosis? Well, you know, the butterfly, the caterpillar changing into a butterfly, as it were. But he's not the same. And <clears throat> in truth, that, that Greek word is not like an outward change, like a caterpillar outwardly looks this way and he transforms into a butterfly and he looks this way outwardly. As in fact, the Greek word there means to give outward expression to your inmost nature. To, I mean, that's the literal, that's it. That's the meaning of metamorphosis or transformation. All right. So, now, I know people that have a hard time with that. You know, they go, well, you know, I can't, I can't do anything for God because, you know, I'm not worthy and I'm messed up, you know. And, um, and they're denying everything that is true as a result of the cross when they do that. They're... They're denying, they're saying they're one thing that they're not. They're saying that they're messed up 
when the truth of them is you're in Christ and Christ is in you and you are already, can I say it like that? You are already a, a butterfly on the inside. You just need to give manifestation to that into the outward realm. It's not an obtaining something. It is a manifesting of something. But let's face it, there is that first and foremost thing, that, that obstacle, that, that w great wall that we have to make it over of changing our mind, being renewed in the spirit of our mind to what God says we are and to believe and to hold God what he says and to look at that cross and to say he wasn't fooling around. He did this so that we would be one with Christ so that we wouldn't have to deny all of that but we could stand with him in it until the Spirit brought the full manifestation. <clears throat> so, so, the, so the proper thing is, well, would you, would you minister to these people or would you do this? Oh, well, I'm unworthy. That's not the right answer. The right answer is, um, as the Lord enables me. Because by his life, I mean, but if we measure ourselves by our past or by our, uh, by our, our mind, how about this? Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. He didn't say, you know, let your mind be in you and then, and, and then just don't do anything for God because you've got a yucky mind. You know, I mean, what scripture is that? First, her First heresy, chapter two. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, I mean, I, I, you know, I had to pass through that, that valley myself, and it wasn't easy because I didn't have a very good self-image either, and it was tough to embrace something that I didn't feel was true of me, but it wasn't true of me in, in all of my manifestation, but it was still true of me in Christ and and his life counted as the life and the resurrection in me and I will tell you this a big difference came when I started acknowledging it from God's perspective a big difference started came to coming because then you know I would act like you know you know I mean you can almost say it I would act like it was Jesus in me and the father would act like it too then. And people started responding to Jesus in me. They did. It was like, huh. Like, it's almost like they see Jesus in me. <laughs> well, that's part of the pattern. It's part of the, and it's part of the, the obstacle that every brother and sister has to, has to climb. That's that, you have to go through that obstacle course and you have to come out on the other side believing. Believing. All right. So I'm going to skip. I got two paragraphs left. I'm doing really good. I'm so happy. <clears throat> so I could even read a little bit now. <clears throat> when considering the passages that we've just set forth, one might ask, to what are we raised, or what specifically is the transformation? <clears throat> We're raised to new life, or a new kind of life. In other words, if we were, if we were a seed that before was like this, and it was all spiky and you know ugly and you know had all this stuff, you know. And, and what we brought forth was all rough and mean and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> we are joined to Christ in his death. There is no amount of trying to die that's going to make you as dead as you are with Christ. <laughs> all the trying in the world cannot produce it. You know, we say, well, okay, I just reckon myself dead. You, you are supposed to reckon yourself dead because you know that you are dead. Amen. You're reckoning on a fact. And I've shared that before, but it's a, the word reckoning there is a uh, bookkeeper term. And it is, uh, and 
many years ago when I got out of the service, um, I got a job with Avis Rent-A-Car and eventually worked uh, and did the books. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, they had all these cars that you rent and they went for, they had a certain mileage and you had to keep track of the mileage and then you had to keep track of, of how much, you know, how far they went and all this kind of stuff. And, and then you, you would, you would reckon everything, you'd take it all apart here and then you'd have to go all the way down here and this number should match what happens this way and this way. And once you're done with it, you can reckon that your figuring was right. Okay. I mean, the one thing you need to know is math counts. Okay. But you have to understand your figuring is right. Okay, well, it's the same thing with the Lord. You look at it one way, and you look at it, and this is what I did. I remember I was going through the scriptures, man. I'd read something, and it it uh, it'd come to this one conclusion. I'm dead with Christ. And then I'd be reading these scriptures over here, and I'd come to it again. And every time, no matter what angle I would go at with that, I kept coming to this corner truth, this corner stone, this corner truth. I am crucified with Christ, and Christ really is my life. And I can, I can reckon on that for sure. And once I begin to do that, and of course the Holy Spirit leads you through that process, and he's faithful to do it, but you have to have a hunger. He's not faithful to do it if you never open the book. And he's not faithful to do it if you... You know, if you if your heart is somewhere else while you're opening the book, well, it's just a fact. You know what I mean? It's like your mind's wandering. I mean, I, I remember doing that. You know, I remember when I was in Bible school, I would try to read, and either the devil would put me to sleep, or I'd start reading, and I'd have to read one verse. I remember I would have to read one verse 50 times trying to understand what it is. But the problem wasn't that it was so tricky. The problem was within two or three words, my mind would wander off to something else. And I was amazed at how this mind, you know, it was like, am I just stupid? What is wrong with me? You know, I mean, seriously, I just was like, this is just crazy. And then I read the verse again and, you know, <clears throat> Finally, I'd just go, put, devil, just put me to sleep, okay? <laughs> I could use the rest. <clears throat> uh, but, but that's part of that obstacle course that everybody has to go through. Man, you, you've got to get to a place, and, and you know, maybe, maybe that requires some prayer or deliverance or something. I don't know. Maybe it requires something special for some people or whatever. But the true deal is when the heart turns to the Lord, you know, you, you get after the Lord, the Lord will cover you, you know. But it's not going to be an easy road. I mean, he doesn't just drop all this stuff in your lap because you say, you, you're, you're moved on during a class or a service, you know, and you go, oh, oh, I want that, you know, right now, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way altar calls and stuff can be. And, and I do a lot of altar calls and stuff, but I, my hope is not in the altar call. My hope is to get him down to the true altar of Christ, crucified. <clears throat> All right. So um, <clears throat> we are raised to new life or a new kind of life, not this, this, you know, spiky kind of seed we were, but up here out of his death, we have a form. We are after the image of the one who died and rose again. We bear the image of the heavenly. <clears throat> All right. So we're raised to, uh, also we're transformed into his image. Although these are truly scriptural answers, I suspect that the questions were asked hoping for more detail than that. Therefore, I say that we are resurrected unto and into a life that is selfless at its core. And we are transformed out of our image and into the only image that God will allow his people to endorse, the image of the crucified. Okay. So, so transformation. Transformation. Transformation is not being this 
round or square, spiky, what have you, you want to look at the, the, the bad seed uh, uh, and making it into a good seed. It is dying to all that you are. And that's so hard for people, and yet, and yet, there's no other, there's no other path that God gives us. It is the path of life. But we call it the path of death. We look, or we look at it as the path of death. We look at it, you know, I, and I remember that too. I remember going, oh, but if I, if I go the way of the cross, then I won't have any fun anymore. Does anybody in, in your right mind here think that I never have any fun anymore? I mean, come on. I have fun. I know how to have fun. A lot of, a lot of Christians who, who won't, you know, who won't give up their life don't have real fun. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I don't want to have to give up, you know, um, my, you know, I remember way back then, that was even before I met Deb when I was in Bible school before she came. I don't want to have to give up my girlfriend or something, you know. You go, well, what if, what if whoever you think your girlfriend right now is not going to be your wife forever? Oh, well, okay, then, you know. But, but he doesn't explain that. <laughs> you know what I mean? He doesn't go, hey, just around the corner is, you know what I mean? He, he won't do that because why would he do that? Because if he did that, then we would be motivated by, oh, okay, you know, and it's really over here instead of him. So he doesn't do that. And we go, well, why won't you answer me? <laughs> he goes, because you're in the middle of that stuff, you know. All right, so in many places in the New Testament, the cross is set forth as the motivating action of the believer. Let me, uh, I haven't finished the sentence. <clears throat> in many places in the New Testament, the cross is set forth as the motivating action of the believer with no reference to the resurrection. Okay, now think about that. If that's true, now, I mean, you know, you, you have to search that out, see if that's true. But if that's true, what kind of deal is that where he is telling us to be motivated by the cross and won't even mention a resurrection? It would be because the cross is not a picture of what you lose. It's a picture of selfless giving as, at its purest. It is the Christ. It is... God incarnate. It is uh, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And our because because we're like this, we hear these things in this we're in this spiky condition. Do you understand what kind of what I'm saying? We're this seed that's not formed in the image of Christ. So we hear it. And it all just sounds wrong because it goes contrary to our nature. Okay, and it, so it sounds wrong. We go, well, I mean, I, I, Brother Randy, you make it sound like it's glorious, but, <laughs> but, there is nobody that can convince you or draw you in to the cross unless you go there willingly. Nobody. Nobody. <clears throat> so there has to be faith. What kind of faith? Well, Abraham went out not knowing. All right? <clears throat> so, so what am I saying? I'm saying many times God will want the, the cross to be the motivating action behind what we do without giving us any reference to a resurrection. Now, let me ask you this. If there's a death, will there be a resurrection? Amen. Okay. 
Well, you know, here's our question. What, well, what kind of resurrection? You know, I don't want to play this card game unless I know what I'm going to win. <laughs> Well, I can say that whatever bristles in you, kind of looks like this little guy right here, whatever bristles in you towards any thought of the cross, with time and, and spending time in the Word, the walls begin to come down and freedom comes because we think we're free and the cross is going to be bondage but we these walls that we have are keeping us in a very limited place and we have no clue where that's going to end up but that kind of um, restriction and limitation can end up with you know we, we go okay well I don't want to go to the cross because it might take away this guy or whatever my husband that got my my future husband that I want. All right. Well, what if by not following Christ crucified, he says, if you seek to save, you lose. Okay. But if you lose, you will you will gain what I have for you, what I plan for you, why I created you. This, I mean, why I created you? You know, we go, I need to find out what my life is, you know, for. Well, ask him. He created you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, well, no, no, I don't want to ask him because he might tell me. <laughs> <laughs> But if he made you for that, you're not going to ever be happy with anything else. I mean, that's just the truth, just the way it is. We can, you know, what did, what did God say to Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, the apostle, the greatest, you know, apostle ever in that sense? Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the goads? Why are you fighting this thing when you just need to get in? <clears throat> and when you do... You don't have to know everything in advance. You just have to know, you know, who you're with. I mean, uh, I think Scott even told my story recently about the, about the father who took the kid to the fair and the kid asked, can I, invite my, can I invite the neighbor kid, my best friend? He goes, yeah. So they're walking along and, you know, the little kid's holding his daddy's hand and they're looking around and everything and the, the neighbor kid goes, look, my daddy gave me $10. I can... Right, you know, everything. I can do whatever I want, you know. And he said, to turn to the other boy and said, what do you got? And he said, I got dad. <laughs> you know, and there's something to that. You don't even know, have to know where he's leading you into all this. He's got the right path. <clears throat> all right. Um, <clears throat> well, my next sentence was consider a bunch of scriptures here. The resurrection as seen in Galatians 2.20 is only seen in one form. The one who selflessly gives himself is the one who now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ. We usually know the first part. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ, liveth in me. And the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I live in faith of this self-giving one. Therefore, I live that this way. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. See? Well, isn't that a, I find that an interesting way of wording that because basically he's saying Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. How many of you believe Jesus did that for you? Okay. He loved you and he gave himself for you. But Paul came to another conclusion from that than what we do or what many do. <clears throat> Paul came to the conclusion 
that that's the way he is. He, he loves by giving himself so that others may live. Okay, that's what he, and so he, he applied that to himself. And he said, okay, how would that apply to me? If it's the same life in me, I am crucified selflessly so that Christ may live in me. You see that? Do we need to go through it again? I mean, you, it's the cross, and he looks at the cross, and he goes, you know, he points at, at Jesus there, and he says, he died that I might live. Praise God. And then he goes, wait a minute. That's the way he is. That's his nature. And if that's his nature, that's his life in me. And if that's his life in me, then I'm going to die that he might live. It is a never-ending cycle. It is a, it is, what that comes by, that only comes by not looking at the cross for what he does for you alone, but looking at the cross to discover the one that's hanging on it and you do that to discover that this, the one hanging on it is the same one who lives in me. So the definition of Christ in me is right there at Calvary. There's the definition of Christ in me. See? There's no, you know, well, it's Jesus in me because I was kind to you today. You know, you... You've been mean to me the last few days. But, you know, it was Jesus in me to just not slap you down. You know. <laughs> well, no, not really, because that's not, that's not selfless giving. That's putting up with somebody. You know, and I know a lot of people who put up with other people, other Christians, and call it Jesus. You know, and so they say, okay, I'll lay down my life for you. You think that's the way the Spirit of Jesus did it? You know, well, I'll lay down my life for you because you're a mess, and I'm not, and I'm holy, and so I'm going to do this for you. You know, that's not Christ. You know, it is Christ to, to t willingly take that lower seat. To not expect anything in return. But, you know, again, that's man trying to explain something that, as best as I can tell, could never be explained by any man. All right. <clears throat> so, um, uh, the one who selflessly gives himself is the one who now lives in me. That is the victory and the reward, a self-giving life. Instead of describing it as the resurrection life of victory. Come on, brothers and sisters. You can have the resurrection life of victory. And God's going, oh, you mean the selfless giving of my son? You know? Anybody seeing what I'm, you know? I, and I, again, I don't have a problem with that, but it is masking God's reality of Christ. And it's just making it fancy terms that stir our soul and make us go, yeah, I want that. Do you want Christ crucified? No, <laughs> but I want, but I would like some of that, you know. <clears throat> um, it describes resurrection in terms of being the same seed as Jesus in his crucified way. Being the same seed as Jesus in his crucified way. In a sense, the early Bible writers emphasized the cross with no resurrection needed unless that resurrection was but defined by Jesus' life within. That's their, you, you see what I mean? That's their definition of the resurrection. It's the transformed life of Christ, as it were. <clears throat> Um, and Romans 6 emphasizing not the thing that comes automatically 
which is life out of death. If, if it die, it'll bring forth fruit. That fruit is the automatic. Resurrection is the automatic. <clears throat> Romans 6 does not emphasize the, what comes forth automatically, which is the resurrection, but the producer or the source from which that resurrection came, which is from that death. So you tell me I have five minutes left. Well, I'm telling you I'm quitting now just because you held that sign up. <laughs> Teasing. Okay, take a break. <clears throat> we did it.